On NewsClick's Mapping False Lines, we often talk about war and conflict, the situations in geopolitical flashpoints which lead to a lot of death and destruction. But what about silent killers, sanctions? Let's take one example. In the late 90s, sanctions in Iraq led to the deaths of over 80,000 people. Between 2017 and 19, over 40,000 people are believed to have died in Venezuela due to sanctions. Why do these sanctions get imposed? What are their impact? Are there ways countries can get out of it? Today we'll be talking about all this. We're joined by Prabir Purkaisa. Prabir, so first let's take a look at this map. A lot of, as you can see, these are 2019 numbers. The numbers may have worsened in these two years. And we have nearly 39 countries which are sanctioned by the United States alone for a variety of reasons, a wide variety of sanctions. So could you maybe take us through the very nature of the sanctions regime itself? Which are the countries which like basically are affected the most and what is the kind of impact that takes place broadly and specifically in some countries? First, let's look at the map itself. This is the Hobart AR projection map. And as you know, this gives us a kind of equal area projection. The areas of countries are represented correctly but the sizes, the shapes do get distorted. This is in contrast to the Mercator projections, which exaggerate the global north, makes Europe, North America look much bigger, Canada look much bigger, Greenland the same size as Africa. So those, this is the reason why we are switching to Hobodair projection when you talk about the world. Now, as you can see from the map, the number of countries the United States has right. imposed sanctions on. There is no other country which has imposed this level of sanctions for a very simple reasons. They do not have the economic or the political power to do so. So US is an outlier of using sanctions as an instrument of its foreign policy. And though there are provisions in the United Nations Security Council, for example, for sanctions, they have been rarely used. In fact, the, before the Cold War ended, the only two other sanctions which were used was against South Africa and I think against Rhodesia at that point, which were both accepted, apartheid countries, yeah. apartheid countries accepted, and those were this kind of sanctions the UN imposed. Otherwise, sanctions were a rarity. They have increased post the fall of Soviet Union and the fact that it, the US has now untraveled power and also the financial controls that dollar has, which we can come to later. You are asking about the impact of the sanctions. Now, impact of the sanctions, you've talked about the direct impact on sanctions. There are two issues which are important. One is the direct expropriation of uh, properties, money that is in the banks and so on. They are very large. For instance, if you take Iran, the amount of money lying, which Iran had already paid the United States for some arms purchases, were also seized. So they were really direct money transfers which had been made against things which US did not uh, deliver, but instead seize the money. So that went through a long process of case and finally US did give back that money to Iran long, long time later. But there's 120 billion dollars of money in various accounts outside the outside Iran, which were lying in international banking within the international banking system, which you were seized, including a building in uh, in in New York, which was about worth a billion dollars if you take current money into account. So 120 billion dollars are also enmeshed into the kind of U.S. sanctions. Then you have, for instance, Venezuela, where its properties have been expropriated. The Sidgo, right. for instance, refinery, which was in the United States. This Venezuelan gold, which was held in UK, Bank of London. Bank of London. So all of these are, of course, direct expropriations. But there's a huge other impact, which is economic. For instance, Iran, the contraction of the Iranian economy uh, after the sanctions and also particularly after the 2018 sanctions, which is an unilateral sanction, illegal, because the United States Security Council had already passed a resolution saying that the sanctions are to be withdrawn. So it was in direct contradiction to what the United Nations Security Council had decided. So that led to a huge fall of Iranian oil exports and therefore a contraction of the Iranian economy. So direct expropriation is one issue. 
but the fall of the targeted countries' economies means also somebody gains. If oil is not going from Venezuela and Iran into other countries, who benefits? So here, of course, U.S. directly benefits because it is also supplying hydrocarbons in different forms. It also, its friends benefit, like Saudi Arabia and various right. other Arab uh, monarchies. Of course, Russia has also gained somewhat because of its supplying hydrocarbons to, for instance, the European Union. But the fall of these countries' economies are huge. So that also has to be factored in when you talk about sanctions. And of course, as you pointed out, what happens to countries like Iran, Iran, Iraq, Iran, Iran, for instance, was banned from also getting medicines and vaccines from other countries. Right. So all of these, if we take into account, the, the impact of sanctions is much larger on the countries than what the actuarial tables or the accounting tables may indicate. Absolutely. And not to mention, of course, Cuba, which has suffered some of the worst sanctions for decades right now and even then has managed to say, target, combat COVID-19. COVID-19 also important because we know that a lot of countries like Iran, Venezuela, they really suffered when it has come to actually purchasing medicines, like you said. Even during this massive crisis, that was the pandemic because either banks did not process these payments or banks blocked them or other co companies were afraid to go into deals with them. Praveer, but the key, another key question here really is how exactly is the mechanism of these sanctions in terms of how does it really work? Because, of course, it's one thing for the United States to state on paper that we are imposing sanctions. But what is the underlying system for that? Well, that's a very important question because that is where the United States today has become the leading sanction imposing power in the world because it has the ability to sanction any country in the world which does external trade. So unless you decide to be an autarchy, you have no foreign trade, or trade with a very few countries and you do a barter trade, you designate your trade in some currency or the other. And most of these transactions pass through either the SWIFT system or directly through the dollar system. Now, the SWIFT system is supposed to be a Belgian clearing house. It is supposed to give messages between two banks or two entities entering into the transaction. So effectively, it's not supposed to be an instrument of direct financial transfer. But the point is, 80 to 90 percent of the global transactions takes place through the SWIFT system. The SWIFT system, though it's a Belgian system, it is overseen by certain banks because it's so central now to the banking systems as a whole. Unfortunately, it has a server in the United States and the United States therefore has claimed it has access, it should have total access to the SWIFT system and therefore it can see which are the entities entered into transactions and therefore it claims that its sanction regime not only touches the primary entities which are being sanctioned, which are named, so the Iranian XYZ companies, but also any company which transacts business with them. Then there is also the secondary sanctions regime. Any country, any entity which has transacted business with an entity which is barred under the US sanction regime. Other companies which can do business with them, they are also touched. So you have a spreading uh, kind of infection of sanctions, which means that if you have been, if you have been sanctioned by, a US, by the US, then that entity is considered untouchable and anybody who enters into any transaction with them are also untouchable. Right. We had, for instance, State Bank of India when we were trying to buy oil from Iran. That was threatened with sanctions and because State Bank of India has a lot of business, therefore it could not transact uh, transactions with, the, uh, with Iran. In fact, India stopped virtually buying Iran oil after a certain point. Same thing European Union, when Trump imposed, reimposed sanctions, European Union said, we will not obey the sanctions. But none of the commercial entities in European Union was willing to either buy or sell goods to Iran because of the threat of secondary sanctions. So because of the control that US has over both the financial system, a lot of the transactions take place in dollars, most uh, transactions takes place right. in dollars. And the second part of it, because of its control today, effectively control over the SWIFT system in terms of access to its transactions, which it didn't have earlier, but which it is really asserted over a period of time, particularly after 2002, 2003. Right. And as you know from Snowden revelations, SWIFT gave complete access 
to the United States. In fact, it could be argued that this is a violation of the Privacy Act that oh. the European Union has passed. But you know, those things are uh, really much further away because is there a will by the, uh, the European Union to assert this right, these rights vis-a-vis -vis the United States? Do they have the ability to actually impose these conditions on the United States is a very important question. Right. So though Facebook has come under certain regulatory bars in the European Union because of the privacy laws, but does it extend to the SWIFT system? That is the op open question. As of date, it doesn't. And therefore, US has total access to the information of all transactions that takes place through the SWIFT system, which is virtually 90% of the world's transactions. Right. Uh, maybe it's falling now, but that is, that is what it used to be. So that is where the US really asserts its control to the SWIFT system, access to the SWIFT system, and because dollar is still the king of currencies right. of tra any transaction that takes place and how foreign exchange holdings are held. Absolutely. Prabir, in this context, of course, once when the Iran sanctions were being discussed, there was a lot of debate about whether there could be an alternative to SWIFT. For instance, whether the European countries or Russia or China could consider this. So right now, could you take us through what is the situation on that front? Because are there any credible alternatives that are emerging and does it look like at any point of time any of these could emerge as a proper uh, you know, system where others could go in place of SWIFT? I think almost all countries in the world, whether it is Russia, China, which are the big entities being threatened, Iran, of course, because it is the primary target, even countries like India, which would like to have the freedom to do what it wants in terms of foreign policy, all of them are thinking about what are the alternatives. So there are two clear channels that are emerging. One is the fact that, for instance, European Union is talking of something called Instex, which they can use for transaction of business. Very little has, it has been used. But the point is, as somebody said it, the plumbing is being set in place, that it can be used if the European Union wants to. So those infrastructures are slowly being put in place. If they want to switch, that they have an alternative at least. Without that, switching doesn't really take place. Second is Russia and China. They are also setting mechanisms which will be outside the SWIFT system. And Russia and China at least can trade between themselves right. and so can they trade with Iran. So alternatives to the SWIFT system are being put in place. But I think the most interesting of this is China combining this with how do you clear the funds? You see, one part of it is okay. You designate your trade to be in not in dollars, but in say, I mean by or uh, something else, digital yuan, X, Y, Z. But how do you transact the business? And the digital yuan really comes in over here because that could be the mechanism of settlement as well. Right. So therefore, instead of having a swift system, the digital yuan would effectively also act both as a currency, as a reserve currency, which of course the, you, the world is now beginning to accept, and also as a mechanism of transfer of money. So therefore, it becomes a dual purpose vehicle. One is acts as a reserve currency, B acts in lieu of the SWIFT system right. as a means of settlement. Mm -hmm. These are long-term issues. They're not going to be short-term issues. We also see, for instance, the, that US has actually lost in terms of the amount of reserves that were held earlier in dollars. Now it's lost some of it from 70%, it has dropped to about 60%. But these drops have taken place earlier as well. Right. The question is, is it a drop which will continue or which it will not? I think the most important issue over here is not what is happening in the financial world, but what is happening in the real world. And if you look at that, then we would understand that the trade, for instance, what's happening to the trade of goods in the world. And you will see that what the post-war scenario was trade with the United States as a dominant element of trade. If you look at the map that you have, then you will see that it's slowly shifting to the trade, the dominant trader or trade with being today China, not the United States. Right. Most countries are trading with China. It is also becoming the largest producer of physical goods, mm -hmm. not intangible goods, but physical goods. Right. And if you take that into account, 
Therefore, the trade being designated in a currency outside the dollar is becoming more and more feasible. And therefore, the long term trend of US overreach in financial sanctions using, using it directly as an instrument of foreign policy, which is what it is doing. And combined with the fact that it is no longer the largest producer of goods in the world, right. nor is it the largest trader in the world, means there could be a secular shift away from the dollar. Absolutely. And that is the possibly the long term trajectory that we are seeing. Right. Thank you so much, Prabir. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click and keep watching Mapping Fault Lines, the only international news show with a genuine map of the world. See you next week.